Well, hello. Kia ora. My name is Jeff. Um, I know some of you I haven't met before. Um, I am studying, I'm training, I'm learning um, to become a pastor. That's my goal. I want to be able to teach the Bible and tell people about Jesus. And so I'm here to kind of do that tonight. Um, but I know that a lot of you don't know me, and I know actually a lot of you adults don't know me either. So I thought maybe we could play a little game so that you guys could get to know me a little bit, and then hopefully later on I can get to know you a little bit too. So for this game, I'm going to tell you three things about myself, three kind of wacky, crazy things, and I want you to guess. See, two of these things are going to be true, but one of them I'm just going to make it up. Okay, and I want you to guess which is going to be the one that I make up. All right, what are some things I can tell you about myself? Well, okay, one thing, once upon a time, I was bitten by a tiger. Do you believe that? No. One time, I dug a hole and slept in it overnight. I dug myself a cave and slept in a cave. You guys remember, do you believe that's true? Okay, all right. And, okay, one last thing about myself. Okay, tonight I came, I came and I brought a big truck full of gold and I'm going to give some gold to everyone tonight. No. No, 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 no. All right, if you're watching on, this, on, on the screen, um, how about you tell the, the adult, the grown-up or someone that you came with, which of those things that you think is, is not true? What did I make up? Did I really get bitten by a tiger? Did I really sleep in a cave? Did I really bring a truckload of gold? All right, how about you guys? What do you think was the thing that I just made up? Bringing a truck full of gold. You got a different guess? Or is it the same? What do you reckon? Okay. How, how about you? <laughs> That's fair. I, I, I can get that. You guess that all of them are made up. But actually, no. One of them is made up, and it was that I brought a truckload of gold. Pretty disappointing, really. That would have been cool. Like... Jeff, we don't care if you fight tigers, we just want the gold. But anyway, I should probably clarify, yes, I was bitten by a tiger, but it was at a zoo and it was like a little tiger cub, like a kitten. It was, it was more cute than anything. Um, and I did sleep in a cave, it was a snow cave. We climbed a mountain and um, found some, some snow and we dug in there and it's kind of like an igloo. Um, yeah, so that was fun. Um, but no, I didn't bring a truckload of gold, which I know is kind of disappointing, but I do actually have something that God says is better than gold, that God says is better than even a truckload of gold. In fact, right here in this, this verse, Psalm chapter 19, verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. And he's talking about this. He's talking about his word. He says that his Bible, his words to us, are better than a truck full of gold. Can you imagine why? Why would he say something like that? Why do you reckon? What's your best guess? I, I like that, um, um, that God says... Any ideas? Um, um, we can come back to you if you like. How about you? What do you think? Why would God say that his word is better than gold? Because his power, his power is good. Yeah, his power is good. And... As well as that, his word, it, it tells us about Jesus. It's when we read his Bible that we learn about Jesus and we grow to know him and love him. And then Jesus, of course, he offers us eternal life, an inheritance that's uh, unfading, imperishable, can't be taken away, kept in heaven for us. And so that's why God says his word is better than gold. It's better than something that can get lost or get stolen or anything like that. So, the challenge for us is to take him at his word, that we would believe that his word is really precious as well, even better than gold. So let's pray. Let's pray that God would help us to do that. God, you've told us tonight that your word, your Bible, is really important, that it's really desirable, that it's something that we should really want. God, we confess, we want to say sorry for the fact that a lot of the time there are things that we want more than that, we would much rather toys or certain people to be our best friends or even a truckload of gold. But God, you say that this is better, and we want to trust you. 
Lord, we thank you that your word shows us your salvation. It shows us Jesus. It's through your word that we get to know him and love him. And so we pray that you'd help us to do that, that we would receive this gift that you've given that's better than gold. We pray this in his name. Amen. Tēnā koutou katoa. My name is Jeff. Um, I'm glad to be able to say yes, I am a real person. <laughs> there are two of us, two Jeffs. And I am um, actually an intern here at, at um, Covenant, as well as being a pastor in training. Um, so it's my privilege to be able to be up here. I haven't been up here in months. So it's, it's nice to be able to do that again and um, see all of you as well. So tonight we are reading from Psalm 19, which I believe is on page 426 of the Church Bible, if you've got one of those. Let me read that for us. Psalm 19. This is God's Word. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In him he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's just pray as we come to it now. Lord, you've just told us in your word that it is perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, true, righteous altogether. Lord, we thank you so much that you have given us your scriptures. We thank you so much that you have not left yourself unknowable, but you have revealed yourself. Revealed yourself to us, your creation, to your people. We thank you that you have spoken and that we have your words here tonight. We thank you that you have given us your spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us through these words. Holy Spirit, would you be with us tonight and speak that we would hear you? Lord, would you open our ears to hear? Help us, Lord, to be hearers and doers of your word. And God, tonight we pray that you would give us a hunger for it. Lord, you say that it's sweeter than honey. Help us to know what that means. Help us to feel that. Lord, would you give us a, a desire to know you, to know your word, to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that tonight you would reveal more of him to us, that we would love and worship our Savior Jesus all the more. We pray this in his mighty name. Amen. Well, if you're here this morning, you will 
recognize the psalm. It's the, the one we were looking at. We're looking at that first part this morning, and, and tonight we, we get to look at that second part from verse 7. And the point of this, I guess, is that we are spending this time while Pastor Logan is away uh, looking at the psalms and looking at what they tell us and how they inform our, our theological framework. That is, what, is, what do the psalms say about how God wants us to think about things, things like the universe this morning, things like his word, things like human beings and topics like that. What does God want us to think about these things? That's what we're hoping to see as we spend some time looking at the Psalms over these next few weeks. Um, And so, as I say, it's my, my pleasure to be able to be here and to bring the second part of the Psalm tonight. I love being able to preach God's word, and I especially love that it's God's word and not mine, um, that this is, is his message that I'm bringing this evening and not my own, not something that I'm making up, not just some TED talk or creative, I don't know, interpretive dance or something. <laughs> I guess part of the reason for that is that I'm, I'm terrible at self-promotion, right? We heard a fantastic sermon this morning. It's really tough to follow up. So it's great to be able to say, no, this is God's word. And, you know, maybe you're the same, right? Maybe this whole, that whole idea of self-promotion is, is really hard. You know, like job interviews are just the worst, like so uncomfortable. Like, I don't know my strength, don't ask me that. Or may, maybe you're the opposite. Maybe you're one of those people that, as um, someone I, I heard say recently, you're quick to believe your own hype. You're, yeah, pretty confident. Maybe that's you. I think what's, what's especially... Um, Kind of interesting is that God is in the business of self-promotion. Um, yeah, I mean, the fact that like, I'm here tonight to, to kind of hype God and His Word, that's in a sense what worship is, um, what proclaiming His glory is. But it's not just because I think that the Bible is the coolest book ever, although, you know, it is, but because God says that it is. As we've just read in these words, he says that it's better than gold and money and food and whatever. He says that it's sweeter than honey. He's the one bringing the hype about his word tonight. And in some ways, it's it's a little bit strange to talk about hype in terms of the Bible. There's probably not much that's less hyped in New Zealand than this book, but these things that God says of it, perfect, sure, pure, clean, enduring, righteous altogether, that, that it, brings, it brings wisdom, it brings joy, it brings enlightenment, that it brings warning and reward. This, this is big talk. This is hype language. So it's, it's worth us spending this time tonight asking, why? Why is it worth the hype? Why is it Worth all of this, why does God say that his word is good and desirable? What about God's word makes it so good and desirable? That's what we'll be considering this evening. But first, just notice that it is God's word that we're talking about. Uh, You'll remember this morning, um, and if you weren't here this morning, you can just kind of zoom out and look at the whole psalm. You see that it doesn't begin with God's word. It begins with the heavens. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims His handiwork. It's about creation. Nature tells us things about God. We can look at the world and know something about God's attributes, who he is and what he's done, what he's made. But notice the shift in verse 7. It's quite jarring when you hear it read. There's this kind of zoom in, this refocus on the law of the Lord. We see that not only does creation speak about God, but God has spoken himself. He's spoken about himself. In the psalm, it it takes us from looking up at the universe or looking out the window to looking down at this book and the way that God especially reveals himself in it, tells us who he is, shows us who he is and what he's doing. We read in verse 7 that he has laid down a law. He has given us a testimony, a story. He has given... In this word, a a map for life, wisdom for living in the world that he has made. Notice also uh, the shift from verse 1 to verse 7. Verse 1 talks about, well, uses the word God. Verse 7, the Lord. It moves from the more general word for God to 
the personal covenant name Yahweh, I am. So the sky, it, it speaks generally of God, its creator, but the, the scriptures, they speak of the personal, intimate covenant God who enters into relationship with his people and loves them with a steadfast love. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. And so, so David, you know, who wrote the psalm, we see that just before verse 1 there, he sees these, these two kinds of revelation, you know, creation in the background and God's word in the foreground, both loudly proclaiming the glory and goodness of God. And he just goes, wow, in verses 12 through 14. It's just, make me more like you. Take sin away from me. Verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So I just draw that out, that distinction there, because I think it's important to see it. The distinction between what nature tells us about God and what God tells us about himself in the Bible. And the reason why is because a lot of people think that the first one is better, right? That if you want to get in touch with God, then you get out into nature. You get out on the water, you go into the bush, you climb a mountain, that that's how you commune with God. And, you know, those are good things. But what creation says vaguely, Scripture says clearly. Creation's speech, it leaves us without excuse, but we need God's special revelation to even just to know what nature is even saying about its creator, as we see in verse 1, that it, it is declaring the glory of God, that it is proclaiming his handiwork. So all of this to say, if you want an authentic encounter and relationship with God, don't climb a mountain, read your Bible. Or, or do climb a mountain, but take your Bible with you. <laughs> to meet with God, to have him speak with you, his, in, his inspired, inerrant, infallible, and sufficient word is better and more desirable. And, and God's people knew this. Um, again and again in these Psalms and in the, the wisdom literature of the Bible, the books like um, Proverbs and things, they, they confess that they would know nothing without the Bible, without God's word shedding light on things. They'd know nothing at all about how the world works and who made it how to live wisely in it. They would know nothing about God and who he is and what he had done for them, the promises that he had made uh, to their ancestors. They'd know nothing about themselves and their condition before God, their ultimate judge and maker. They'd know nothing about their sin and their need for a savior. So without God speaking in his scriptures, they would know nothing. And so they delight in his word. The psalm, is, it's a song. It says there at the, the beginning part, the little introduction, to the choir master. It was a song for the choir. They would sing together, sing together of the greatness of this book. They would sing of how good and desirable God's word is. It revived their souls, it says in verse 7. It refreshed them to read the stories of God's faithfulness to his covenant to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Now, it gave them wisdom, wisdom which became the, the envy of nations, desirable wisdom, which we have right here. We hold it in our hands. It's, it's refreshingly ancient and unchanging compared to the shifting sands of social media. It brought them rejoicing in verse 8 there. Joy to know that God himself, the God of the universe, loves them with a steadfast love, that he dwelt with them and he was committed to showing them loving kindness. It uh, enlightened their eyes, it made them alert and aware of God's ways, spurring them on to, to live in, in reverent fear and worship of God. And as we see in verse 11, there is warning and reward, warning and forsaking it, reward and keeping it. And you see that general pattern throughout the whole Old Testament narrative of when God's people read and obey, they do well. And when they forsake and disobey God's word, they face disaster. And so we see from that that God's word is actually good for them. It's good for them as a country. 
um, it's, it's desirable. Israel's laws were the, the envy of the other nations. And so it's right that God would hype his scriptures. It's, God, it's right that he would promote them because he promotes them for our good. But do they live up to it? Do they live up to all this hype? Look at verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Fear and rules. Kind of hard to get hyped about fear and rules. Um, you know, rules and restrictions and regulations. I mean, how many of you get excited to read the workplace health and safety manual? And what about Paul in, in Romans and Galatians? Doesn't he say that the law is, is um, powerless, right? He seems to talk quite negatively about it. And then, of course, it doesn't help that there are, are loads of Christians that say that God's word is not good and desirable. And they say things like, um, you know, not all of it is true. Uh, it's not really that important. You don't need it to be a Christian. You just take the parts that you like, put them on your wall. They don't have time for verses like 2 Timothy 3.16, which says all of Scripture is God-breathed and useful. Um, or you have Christians who say that God's the, the Bible is, is not really that desirable, right? Like, it's okay, but what you really want is something else, something more, some kind of, um, like, experience or sense that God is speaking just to you, perhaps out in nature or perhaps in a worship service. They ignore verses like um, 2 Peter 1.19, where Peter insists, no, the Bible is better. It's more sure. God has, has given us his word for anyone to read. And then, of course, lastly, you have those Christians who hold a big stick and say, if you're not reading 10 chapters a day, are you even a Christian? Right? You don't have to desire it. You just got to do it. And all of these voices all from people who say that they're Christians make seeing God's word as good and desirable actually quite hard. Now, I'll admit I am all three of those Christians sometimes. Um, there are, you know, sometimes God says things that I wish he hadn't. Uh, some days I just want to put my Bible on the shelf and do faith some other way. And, um, you know, other days I, I tell myself that if I just sort of read so much, so many chapters, I can tick that off for the day. I do all of these things. It's, it's, it's hard sometimes to believe that the Bible is actually good and desirable as God says that it is. That it is all that he says it is here in these verses. That it's, it's not just empty hype. You know, even the ancient choirs who sung the song, right? Delighting in the revealed word of God. They don't end by patting themselves on the back and giving each other high fives. No, they go, ooh, verse 12 who can discern his errors? Well, God's word, it's, it's perfect, it's right, it's pure, it's righteous altogether, but I'm not. There's stuff wrong with me that I don't even know about. Hidden faults. I don't match this standard of sure and right and clean and true. And we've just read that they're more to be desired than gold. But do I actually feel that way? Do I really believe that this is more valuable than a new phone or a new car? That it's sweeter than ice cream or romance or a happy family? You know, when we know that we don't measure up to the moral standard that God's word lays down, it's really hard to desire it. It's hard to be in it. It's way easier to desire a successful career, or even just whatever's trending on Netflix or other websites. You know, we are so keen to distract ourselves from the sin that God's Word points out in us that we'd rather bury ourselves in more sin just to numb us from it, to numb us from the truth. I mean, that was Israel's story, wasn't it? They sang about how, God, how good God's Word is, but then they would ignore it. And they'd go deeper and deeper into the things that God had warned them away from to the point where they were almost destroyed by the wrath of his judgment. Is that what will happen to us? What hope do we have? What hope is there for us to find 
joy for us to receive these benefits of, of refreshment and wisdom for us to have a personal relationship with the God who speaks. What hope do we have if the words that he's given, the, his very character that he reveals in them, just condemns us every time we look at the page? I mean, do you, do you feel that? Like, you know, sometimes I, I can't come to God's word because I know what else I've been looking at or thinking about or doing, and I know that God knows that too. Where do we go with that? Now look with me at verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. David, the psalmist, he feels what we're feeling. He recognizes that there actually needs to be something better than creation, which just leaves us without excuse, as it says in Romans 1. He recognizes that there needs to be something better than God's law even, which Paul in Romans 3 agrees only has the power to condemn us. He recognizes that we need a redeemer. We need a savior. We need someone who will drag us out of our sorry state, who will buy us back into God's loving family, who will save us from our hidden and our presumptuous sins. He recognizes that we need a rock, a hero who fights for us, someone who stands firm where we slip and fall, someone or a hope that we can cling to when those doubts and accusations fly. Now, if, we, if we're going to see God's word as, as truly good and desirable, then David recognizes that God's going to have to work a miracle. John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The true Word of God, who is, is perfect and sure and right and pure and clean and enduring and true and righteous altogether, is a man. The perfect revelation, the perfect representation of God Himself. This is my beloved Son, He says with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Jesus is the true word. He is the true light which enlightens everyone, who brings grace and truth, who makes the Father known. And he, as the psalm teaches, is good. Where Israel failed, where we failed to live up to God's perfectly moral character, he succeeds. Um, the law, verse 7, of love Fulfilled by Christ and exemplified by him is perfect. Now his, his testimony, the testimony of the Lord, his, his word, his stories, his teaching is sure. The commandment of the Lord in verse 8 to repent and believe in Jesus is pure, pure and simple. The fear, verse 9, the, the reverence, the worship of Jesus Christ will endure forever in the new creation. The rulings, the, the just decrees of God, like this is my son and it is finished and you are a high priest forever, seated at the right hand of God, faithful and just to forgive and nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. These decrees are true and righteous altogether. Jesus is the word, the message, the revelation of God incarnated in the flesh. And not only do these verses in the psalm describe the Lord Jesus, but he also brings the benefits of Psalm 19 in a whole new way. Jesus revives souls in union with his own resurrection life, as we read in Romans 6. Jesus makes the simple wise because he is the wisdom of God, as we read in 1 Corinthians 1. Jesus rejoices the heart with an inexpressible and glorious joy as we believe 
and love and trust in him, as we read in 1 Peter 1. And Ephesians 1 speaks of our hearts being enlightened, uh, to know the hope and riches and power of having the Lord Jesus Christ as our head. Life, wisdom, joy, enlightenment. Jesus is the word of God and he is good. And we could go on. I mean, he is good. He gives us his goodness. He gives us himself. Uh, it's only in him that God can, verse 12, declare us innocent from our faults. It's only in Christ that the dominion of sin we read about in verse 13 is, is truly broken. It's only in Christ that our, our words and our hearts and our lives can truly be acceptable in the sight of God. He is our Lord, our rock, and our Redeemer. God's word shows us the true word. God's word is good and desirable because it shows us his salvation. It shows us Jesus Christ. Perhaps you remember the two stories that Jesus himself told uh, in Matthew 13, 44 to through 46. Uh, the story is about a, a man and a merchant, right? The man, he finds treasure buried in a field. And he's so excited that in his joy, he sells everything he owns so that he can buy that field and get that treasure. And likewise, the merchant, he finds a pearl, like in a, a market or something, and he sees it and he knows its value. He knows that it's worth everything he's got. And so he too sells everything he has in order to get that pearl. And Jesus says that my kingdom is like that. My kingdom is like that treasure and that pearl, in that it is worth everything you've got to lose. It is more desirable than all the treasures on earth. God's word is better than gold because it leads us to something that lasts forever, to a treasure that goes well beyond. It's sweeter than honey because God wants us to enjoy Jesus, to find life in him. That's why it's worth the hype. That's why it's good that God is in the business of self-promotion. That's why he calls us to delight in his word, which leads us to his son who, of course, offers us eternal life with him. So, what do we do with it? Well, I guess the obvious thing is read it, right? <laughs> it's kind of the obvious application from the psalm. Read the Bible. You know, hear it. Um, study it. Sing it. Pray it. Uh, share it with others. Teach it. And if that sounds difficult, then well, maybe you could find someone who can help you with that. Um, to sort of see what it looks like to study God's Word and to delight in it. Um, if you're a woman, I know that the woman's Bible study on a Wednesday is just starting to study the book of Hebrews. Perhaps you should join and see what it looks like from other people to study God's Word and delight in it. Or perhaps you need to invest in some resources uh, that will help you understand or um, that will make it more accessible if you're short on time. If those are the things that you need, you know, these are just some practical suggestions, some takeaways from tonight that might be useful for you. But of course, as I mentioned earlier, it's really easy. It's all too easy to turn this kind of thing into a club that we just bash ourselves and each other with, you know, read your Bible. Why don't you go into all the groups, buy all the commentaries, stop making excuses. But it's clear from the psalm that God wants us to enjoy his word. He wants to delight in it, to savor it, to enjoy the Lord Jesus. Uh, Alistair Groves from CCEF, he made this observation that when you get just busy throughout the day and you wind up missing lunch, by the afternoon, what do you feel? It's not guilt, is it? It's hunger. You don't feel guilty that you missed lunch, you feel hungry. You want food. What if we could swap that unhelpful and unmotivating guilt that we feel about not reading the Bible enough or failing my Bible in a year resolution and turn it into a hunger, a godly hunger for his word, for the bread of life that satisfies our groaning souls? How do we grow that desire in ourselves? Well, first, maybe there's something in your life that you need to address. Maybe there's something that you know God is telling you is wrong. 
And it's kind of hard to delight in God's word, to love it when you deliberately ignore what it says. But if that's the case, if that's the situation for you, then I, I just want you to know that Jesus is there to meet you with gospel grace, to meet you with mercy. He says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1.9. 1, you see, the gospel, the, the good news that whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned but has eternal life, will not perish. This news, it frees us to be able to look at God's glorious goodness revealed in his word and not to run away. But instead, like David, to be able to say, I want to be like that. I want to be like you. I want you, Lord God. Keep sin from me. Make me blameless. I want my words and my thoughts to be like yours. Jesus is the one who can, can cleanse us and declare us innocent and blameless. So confess your sin, experience his forgiveness, and you will grow in delight in him. And second, just another suggestion as we think about how we might grow that desire and hunger for God's word. Perhaps one way might be that you pray your way through Psalm 119 this week. Um, it's a long psalm, so it might take you a while. Um, listen to this, listen to what I, what I mean by that. This is Psalm 119 from verse 25. Perhaps you could pray through it something like this. Lord God, my soul, it clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. When I told of my ways, you answered me. Lord, please teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts. And I'll meditate on your wondrous works. God, my soul, it melts away for sorrow. Please strengthen me according to your word. Put false ways far from me and graciously teach me your law. Lord, I've, I've chosen to uh, the way of faithfulness. I've, I've set your rules before me. I, I cling to your testimonies. Oh, Lord, please let me not be put to shame. Lord, help me to see that it is good, and I will run in the way of your commandments, God, when you enlarge my heart or when you set my heart free. You know, maybe you need to pray this week that God would enlarge your heart for his word, that he would set it free to love the Lord Jesus. You see, God's word is good, and it's desirable. Brothers and sisters, it's worth the hype. It's worth all this self-promotion here in these verses in Psalm, 109, in Psalm 19 and Psalm 119. Because the Bible is good and desirable because it reveals God's salvation. It's good and desirable because it shows us Jesus Christ, our Savior and the greatest treasure we could ever know. As it says in verse 10, More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey. And drippings of the honeycomb. Let's pray. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, you are our rock and our redeemer. We thank you that you have given us your word and through it we can know you. Not fully, but truly. Thank you that you desire for us to know you. You desire for us to desire you. Lord, you know that your word is good for us, that it is desirable. And God, we, well, we confess that um, while you say that your word is bread for life and that it is sweeter than honey, often we don't feel that. Perhaps it's because we've been gorging ourselves on the, the fast food, the lollies of distracting work or, I don't know, stuff on TV. Even our families can drag us away from you. Lord, we pray that you would help us to refocus. We pray that you would give us an appetite and a desire. We pray that you would help us to see that your word is good and desirable. We pray that you would confirm these things to our hearts, that we would know them as we read your word, as we delight in it, Delight to read it, delight to sing it together here this afternoon and evening. As we pray it, as we hear it spoken to us, 
Lord, we pray that in it we would see Jesus in all his glory. That you would enlarge our hearts to love him. We pray in his name. Amen.